So happy to be back for another episode of the Cancer Warriors. Hey, Amanda. Hey, Rick. It's good to be back again. <laughs> yes, it is. It looks like uh, you're on the road, huh? You are constantly on the road. Yeah, yeah. I'm bouncing around a bit nomadic lately, but yeah, <laughs> it's been good. It's been all beautiful locations, so I'm feeling very blessed. <laughs> That's really cool. And I know that uh, I, I remember when I used to... Uh, stock your Facebook and horrible word. <laughs> and it's like, how did she end up in Egypt this week uh, <laughs> or wherever it might be? Oh my gosh. It's always, you always have a different background every week. And that's so cool. I used to uh, live my life that way once upon a time. Love <laughs> it. It's good for you. Yeah. Lately it has been a bit like that, but yeah, that's the beauty of being able to record and connect remotely so we can do these anywhere. I know it's super cool. I'm excited about uh, today's episode. We have a, a gentleman on that, you know, I, I guess you'd say he and I have some things in common. We both come from that wild, wacky world of professional wrestling. But uh, until today, we, we've never before met. So it's always it's always cool, I think, to have uh, you know something in common. Well, of course, we all have cancer in common, and that's what we're going to talk largely about today. But one thing that's impressed me about Sean, and we'll give him a, a full introduction in a moment, uh, watching from afar, is the way that he has treated this in his written word. And it comes across as very sincere, very genuine, and, and very strong. Now, on the surface, of course, he's a pro wrestler, so he's physically going to be strong. You and I know that that, that the physicality and the mind don't always meet up when we're faced with what's termed a life-threatening situation. And I think we're, um, I think we're going to get some cool information and a, just a little bit of uh, inspiration today. Yes. I'm really excited to bring them on. So let's do it. Cool. So that said, let's bring on our guest today known as, this is so, you ready for this? So close to our name. He's known on social media and elsewhere as the cancer fighter, Sean Wechter. How are we doing, guys? How's everything? Rick, Amanda, it's been a pleasure yeah. to meet you guys. I get to chat with you today. Yeah, good to, good to meet you. Good to meet you. How's uh, how's things on the East Coast? Are we uh, getting Ooh. off there a little bit? We're, uh, we're we're getting a little chilly here. We're getting ready for Santa Slay to touch down in a couple of weeks, you know, and start getting the holidays going. But with those holidays in the Northeast comes that very uh, chilly weather that I don't love too much <laughs> it's, it's nor just, do i <laughs> it's, it's amanda i know that you and sean I, I guess your primary residences are not terribly far apart from one another and i'll, I'll bet you're just dying to race back to uh, new york and new jersey huh amanda no <laughs> 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 no, that is, that is not necessarily my primary residence right now. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm avoiding going back there. Yes, well, I lived down here for quite a while. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to stick to the warm weather as much as possible. Nice. Well, let's not let's not torture Sean with our respective yeah. reports today, because that would just not be nice. <laughs> 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 Well, in any case, man, it, it, it's good to meet you. Been uh, following you on social media for a minute now. And, and dude, I, dig, I dig your attitude. Um, you know, we're going to pull back a, a bunch of layers today. Cool. And you know, one, one thing is people read, you know, we hear all the time now, well, people just present what they want people to believe on social media. And, you know, I, I think those of us who are in this game, can usually read between the lines and, and see through that pretty easily. And I just wanted to say um, that you, you, you strike me as being very genuine in your story and in your battle and in your strength. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and congratulate you for that. Well, thank you very much for that. That, uh, that, that really, uh, those are some very kind words and very appreciated from coming from someone I deeply admire. So thank you. Thank you for that. Amanda. Take it away. I know you have a question. Well, okay, Sean, I would love to know. Uh, well, I guess share for the audience's sake what you were diagnosed with, what that process was like. And I would love to hear what it was like for you when you heard those words and how you approached it initially. Because it was 
pretty dire diagnosis by the doctor's standards. So yeah, I would love if you could share a little bit about that journey. Of course, and I, and I apologize if I skip over the little part because I would like to give some background information just because yeah. my mindset and attitude, I can't fully credit to myself. I uh, was raised by uh, my parents and uh, my father is a retired uh, Vietnam uh, Army Ranger. He served for uh, two tours over in Vietnam. Uh, he wound up uh, coming home and became a police officer. And he's a retired uh, narcotics detective from Nassau County Police here on Long Island. So uh, having that upbringing and two grandfathers that both served our country during World War II, I had, I wouldn't say a strict upbringing, but a, a disciplined one, which not only helped me but with athletics, but when I ran into um, my neck injury that I had and then subsequently the cancer, um, I was greatly prepared for that by those great men that I have been blessed to have, you know, in my life. And unfortunately, my grandparents are no longer with us, but uh, my dad's still kicking. And every once in a while, he, uh, he'll he throw a little pearl of wisdom and a little at me too. So, but uh, basically in, in 2016, I went a, a good stretch of time, uh, not feeling too well, lots of headaches, lots of dizziness, lots of eeks and ooks and aches. And unfortunately, coming from an athletic background, playing football and lacrosse in college, playing arena football for a year, and then taking my hand and trying wrestling a few different times. Uh, I, I had some war wounds. And like I said, I've had over uh, nine neck and back surgeries. So when I was going to my different doctors and saying, look, something's not right, unfortunately, they kept pinging the, the finger back at, uh, oh, it's your neck, or maybe you had a concussion or something that you, and it just, it's lingering. And I told them that that's not really the case. I'm sorry, with all due respect to your education and your medical knowledge, who knows someone better than themselves? And I knew something was not right. And it went on for months. And I'm almost embarrassed to say there was one time that I went to the local hospital in desperation because I had a, a seizure-like episode. And when I got to the hospital, they thought I was conjuring this and almost wanted to put me on a, a, a psych hold thinking that I was making this all up in my head. And two months later, I wound back up in that exact emergency room with a massive brain bleed and a stroke caused by a golf ball sized tumor in my cerebellum. And, you know, you don't want to say like, well, jokes on you. But when I went back in there with a bout of Bell's palsy going on, uh, vomiting, they still wanted to just put me into the, you have a head cold area. And I had to use some rather crass language to make sure that they gave me a scan instead of just dismissing me. And within 30 seconds of being in that machine, they pulled me out and it was, you know, code gray stroke team room five. And then you're like, Oh wait, I'm room five. You know, as everything's starting to kind of rapidly spiral around you and, you know, my, my father brought me to the hospital and my mother was on her way to meet him and I, but they were unfortunately cleaning out my aunt's house who just passed away from adenocarcinoma. And I gave the eulogy at her funeral. And now two months later, there I am on this table surrounded by doctors while my father is stoic as he could be. I could tell through his eyes that he, he, he was scared. And, uh, we had to wait a week. Um, they had to stabilize me. Uh, I had a ton of transfusions. We eventually got to the craniotomy, a covering doctor from another great hospital in the area uh, had did the op done the operation. And he, he came out to my father in the waiting room. And he says, I've been doing this for 35 years. And I'm sorry to tell you, but your son not only has cancer, but has melanoma. And being he was visiting the doctors at that great hospital that wanted to put me on a psych hold, started going, no, 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 don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. You're not sure. And he said, no, I'm not letting you drag this family on for weeks while we have their kid in the hospital. He's uh, He's got cancer. So the next morning when I came to from the procedure, I, I just looked over at my father and, and he grabbed my ankle pretty firmly. And he said, uh, I need to tell you something. And I said, go ahead, dad, tell me what you need to tell me. He goes, you have cancer. And I just looked 
directly at him. And I said, okay, sir, let's take care of this. And my mother would later tell me that, that she was never prouder of me in her entire life. And my mommy. My I, got it. I have to ask this question. And I, I'm sorry. I'll apologize in advance. As Abana knows, I have a tendency to interrupt. Was that, that was your immediate, re your immediate response? Well, to, again, to give it a little bit of a backstory, when I broke my neck and back, um, I had gone to an MRI and, you know, they did the brain first. And they said, okay, Mr. Wachter, everything's great. Just hold on. We're going to switch over to the neck now. Did the scan and all of a sudden the machine turned off and the tech comes through and says, hey, we need to, uh, we need to keep you in here for a second. Is there anyone here with you? And now at that point, I'm saying something ain't right. And yeah. of course, my, my dad, my guardian angel, my best friend, he was there and, and he came down and they pretty much told him, we're going to need to take your son by, uh, by ambulance to the hospital right now. Uh, he's about one bad sneeze from his spinal cord being completely cut off. Wow. And as I, as I was yeah. laying there prepping for them to do this procedure, I, I started to cry. I started to cry. Uh, I was nervous. And I just remember my dad grabbed my leg, not, not my ankle, somebody just grabbed my thigh and said to me, you need to toughen the blank up. There's, there's no turning around at this point. You can either go forward or you could just collapse yourself on the floor. And I just said, okay. So when we got to that point of me being diagnosed with cancer and him grabbing that ankle, I know it's apples and oranges, but we were already in a situation where before someone's telling me, you may never walk again. And I got the boohoos out of my system. So when it came to this, I knew what the other reaction from him would be. So I gave him the reaction that him and my grandfather had taught me to, you know, present. And that's just, okay, things stink, but let, let's get to work. Let, let me let me push into that for just a moment, if you don't mind. And I think oh, that's amazing. Sure. And your, your, your mother expressed how proud she was of you. Are, are those... You, you said your grandfather taught you that when you yeah. spoke those words, was that for them or did you actually feel that at that point? I, oh, I, I felt it was in your gut. I, I, in, in my gut, I, I realized that I, I've never been someone to, to quit something. I, I've never been. I'm, I'm a stubborn person. If you tell me I'm not going to do something or I can't do something. OK, you might as well get yourself a seat because I'm going to go ahead and take care of it. I don't even care what I have to do. That goal will be accomplished. And I just know that seeing my father, seeing my mother, both being as rock solid as they could be, I realized I had a responsibility to them to make sure, part of my language, that I kicked this thing's ass. That's that's great. That's great. And, and language is fine, by the way. <laughs> that was hardly the <laughs> We've heard here on the Cancer Warriors. Uh, that's quite a, quite all right. Um, yeah, and, and I'm sorry to like push on you about that. Well, just, oh, please ask as much. You know, th this is this is all I desire to do is, is share this story yeah, and, and hopefully you. inspire thank one person because then to me, I, I've served my purpose and I would yeah. relive it yeah. all over again. And I love that you explain it that way because you, I'm sure you know as well as Amanda and I do that some people upon getting the news just freaking lose it. And there's no, um, you know, ultimately, hopefully they find their strength. But for most, it's it's a long journey. It ain't, it ain't that quick. That's for sure. So I'm curious about that. And, and I wonder, do you think your opinion, someone that gets the news, do, if they're prone to freaking out, if that's their lifestyle, if, that's, if they haven't been taught the way you are, is there any chance that they can get that same kind of strength that you had quickly? You know, I think that that type of strength can can be learned and I think it could be learned quickly and, you know, not to, you know, harp on this wonderful connection we share in this wacky world of wrestling, but it's even something like that. Like as a child, I used to draw strength from watching wrestling all the time. And that's where I think wrestling is so important to so many people because it's, it's a rock and a storm for folks. It, it gives comfort. It lets people live in a world of, you know, suspending disbelief. It lets them enjoy art because that's what to me wrestling is. But I feel people could get inspiration in any any form or any way. And it could be something that could be learned because 
you know, not only my dad and my grandfather's taught me this way of perseverance, but, you know, it, it's just as time started to go on very quickly in a brief window, I had a few, like I call benchmark moments that kind of solidified my, my mindset. And if you'd like, I'll, I'll gladly share them with you. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Please, please do. And maybe point you a little bit with that. I'm taking in everything you're saying. And, and Amanda, I, I'm guessing knowing you, you're, we're probably thinking along the same ways. These benchmarks you're talking about, how could somebody, you know, if you keep this in mind while you're telling us, how would someone that doesn't have these, these tools in their kit adopt these tools or similar ones so they're better positioned to come out of this challenge the way you and I and Amanda have? Well, I'll tell you, some, some situations I think we could figure out how to help some folks learn, but there's other situations that I had in these benchmark moments that just happened to be time and place. For example, so I spent over a month in that lovely hospital, and when I got out, I was very fortunate enough living so very close to Manhattan that I have Memorial Sloan Kettering right there, who I happen to also do some work with for advocating for them and some some marketing stuff that we're going to be getting involved, which is pretty cool. Uh, but when I got out of having the craniotomy, uh, that's basically where they go in, radiation, laser knife to remove the tumor, uh, they have to clean up the tumor bed. So I had radiation at Sloan Kettering. And back when I had first gotten sick in 2016, there was no division between pediatrics and, and adult radiation units. So at 31, I'm going into a radiation waiting room with people that are similar in age to me, but they are not there because they have cancer. They're there because their two-year-old son or daughter has cancer. And to me, that was the first benchmark. And that was the, don't you dare feel sorry for yourself. Don't you dare feel bad because those children have not even had a chance yet to make a mistake. At 31, I failed and made so many mistakes and I lived a full life. So to me, it was like, no, you're not going to cry. It's, it's these kids that need the sorries and the prayers, not you. So that's benchmark one. And like I said, unfortunately, I think that's one of those things where now there is a division, which is great because Memorial Sloan Kettering has MSK Kids, which is an awesome pediatric oncology program. But again, it's it's a situation. You know, I, I just happen to be in a place at a time. Um, the next thing is when I came home, um, like I had said to you, I noticed that I had a responsibility to my folks to continue on and, and really kick this thing's ass. However, I also had another great blessing. I had over 30 high school and college and professional teammates actually sort out an Excel spreadsheet and they would all take turns and shifts and times. Wow. Who's going to hang out with Sean? Who's going to go just watch the game? Who's going to go get a pizza? When I'm in the hospital, I think at one point the nurse told me I had 13 people in my hospital room and they had coolers full of beer, ice, pizza. We have, you know, I said, what are you guys doing here? And they said, it's Monday night. We watch Monday night football and Monday night raw together. So here we are. And it was just like, that was cool. But so all those people in mind, all those awesome people, that great support system I had, there's a gentleman named Inky Johnson. Rick or Amanda, have you had the chance to hear about Inky Johnson by chance? I'm not familiar with the name. Okay. No, I, I, would, I, I would tell folks, and maybe this is how some of the folks that are dealing with this, unfortunately, could kind of get some of the mindset in their, in their toolkit. Um, Inky Johnson is a motivational speaker, but he was a number one ranked cornerback for the University of Tennessee. Uh, he was projected uh, to go within the top 10 of the NFL draft. And he was making a routine tackle play in West Point, And he tore the artery and his nerves going into one of his arms. So it almost killed him, but it most certainly took away football. And it was one of those 
movie style stories where poor socioeconomic background, you know, nine kids in the two bedroom house, the aunt, the grandmother, and he was going to make the NFL and he was going to take them all away from that. And he realized that that, that means of getting them what he had promised was now gone. And he thought about throwing in the towel and there's a great video. And this was the video I heard. And this is the second one that clicked for me. It's called, it's not about you. And essentially he said, he realized that if he didn't pick himself up and, and try to muster on, he would be letting down so many people that viewed him as so many things. And I laid in that bed and I said, you know what? I know I am responsible for my parents, but those 30 great friends and, and teammates that all banded together, you know, my, my parents would lose their son. My grandmother would lose their, their grandson. My friends would lose their teammate. It just, it wasn't about me. So giving in was not a, an option. And then the third benchmark that I would say is, and this to me was a little eerie, when I gave my aunt's eulogy when she died from adenocarcinoma, the one that my parents were running over to clean out her house when I had my uh, stroke, um, I took to the lectern and I, and I didn't really know what to say. She fought very hard, but, you know, she still continued to live her life. She didn't listen to the doctor towards the end because she said, to me, this is the end. So she still traveled to Ireland. She still enjoyed her whiskey. She still tried to go to Civil War reenactments. So I, I conjured up uh, Stuart Scott's quote, the ESPN sportscaster who unfortunately passed the cancer. You know, in 2014, they honored him at the ESPN SB Awards and gave him the, the Jim Valvano uh, Courage Award. And Stuart gave this quote that I gave at the lectern and then turned into that benchmark three for me, which was when you die to cancer, die from cancer, it doesn't mean you lose the cancer. You beat cancer by how you live, the manner in which you live, so live. And that's what kept going around in my head because I said to myself, and this now at the time, I get, I get that 12 week diagnosis and I said, I'm not going down. I'm not going down. And if I well, do 12 week, like terminal pronouncement is what yes, you're referencing. Yes. 12, 12 weeks. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going out like this. I'm going to go out swinging. I'm going to live my best life. And as we started to progress, uh, you know, through my cancer journey, and we actually started to do something wild and that was get stable scans. The first thing I said to my father was, I'm not rotting away on your couch. And I applied for a local high school football coaching position and I got it. And I'll tell you that was another, it wasn't a benchmark moment, but it really helped me because I had those kids depending on me, but I don't think they realized I depended on those kids. That's what service does, man. Absolutely. Recommend that for everybody. So Sean, that that's powerful stuff, dude. So to, to recap, yep. you, you saw kids, tiny parents with tiny kids going through it. There's some, don't dare, don't you dare feel sorry for yourself. You have, you're the example of a football player. It's not about you, which is amazing. I'm going to look that up uh, later today. He's a, he's a great guy. He, I recommend if, if, if people can't get something from that particular talk he did, then there's countless other ones that I feel people can get some inspiration Absolutely. from. And, and I love that you ref you actually just said that because you're right. There are so many great examples that we can follow. So you, you have that following example of this gentleman being there for your family, understanding others have it worse. Don't feel sorry for yourself. I mean, the thing with the 30 friends, that's wonderful. But not everybody will, will have no, of course. available to them in their lives. Everything else you said, it's amazing. It's so relatable because it's all choice based. And, you know, th those I think are such great examples that anybody could hear and understand they have the opportunity, I think, to utilize in, in their journey, their cancer journey, or just in life in general, really. So good, good for you for, for having that viewpoint of life. Man. It's amazing. That yeah, can I just jump in to kind of recap from a different perspective? Sure. Uh, everything in there is like, is amazing. Um, but to encapsulate it, like it's, it's essentially a downward comparison that 
you, you, there's no point in complaining because there is somebody else who has it worse. You're like, at least I'm not about to die. At least I didn't die last night. That downward comparison, it gets a little morbid. Like, at least I'm not in that position where the parents have the tiny children, you know? So that downward comparison can actually shift your mentality quite powerfully. And then it brings you into a state of gratitude for where you are and that you're not that far down. So it's actually super, super powerful. I just wanted to reiterate that because that's what's really happening is like that downward comparison boosts your own mentality about your own situation. You're like, oh, wait, it could be so much worse. I'm grateful it's not any worse. And so it's like, it's really actually quite powerful. And then the community and support thing, I... That's incredible. 30 people on an Excel spreadsheet yeah. <laughs> to make a up like that. I know most people don't have that, but the, you know what I would say to that, to anybody listening who might not have that, is like, don't be shy to reach out and ask because a lot of people don't know how to talk to you when you're going through it. So they'll yes. wait for you, yes. which is a little frustrating. I'm not going to lie, but people yes. don't always know how to handle it when somebody gets diagnosed. So allow yourself to be a little vulnerable and allow yourself to ask for help and, and you know, reach out and you never know who's gonna come out of the woodwork. Honestly, you never know. Like people came out of the woodwork when I was diagnosed myself. And it was it was really humbling and beautiful. Um, and yeah, the whole do it for, I totally resonate with the whole do it for your family. So real brief, my uncle had passed away uh, the, the, the night before that I called up my doctor and said, I need a CT scan and I got the scan the day before we left for his funeral and it was when we landed that I got the results so the the, the vibe was I had to survive I had to do it for the family because we couldn't handle another one and my sister was about to get married so it was like I had to do it for them too and yeah there's the whole um the getting the job thing <laughs> I did something similar. I gave myself things to look forward to. I enrolled in like a whole new program to get a new certification. And I, I scheduled a retreat for myself. So it's like you're investing in the future. You're automatically putting yourself in a state of having a future and being committed to living that future. It's actually very powerful to give yourself something to do in the future like okay i'm gonna be healed like i was visualizing myself healed at my sister's wedding i enrolled in this course or i you know i was researching all these different things i was like what can i do next because i can't go back to that job <laughs> and and you know just this idea of also giving yourself something to look forward to is really really powerful and then you have something that you get to show up for like the kids at your football team so that's really cool thank you for sharing all of this it's really powerful oh, you know it's it's like you said it, it, it's almost like steps of progression to go ahead and say like i will have a future and i think you know a lot of folks unfortunately don't realize like there is life during cancer just because you get a mm -hmm. diagnosed like Man, I, I, I feel sometimes awful feeling as if though I'm preaching to folks because I know every situation is different, you know, and I don't want to say, well, this is what you need to do. But, you know, like you said, planning for a future, you know, life during and after, you know, once I got done with my first season back coaching football and, you know, I went with all, all those crazy, wacky friends of mine that helped together. I took them all on different trips and we very morbidly called the Sean Wachter death tour. Because I figure, I figure if you I love can, that, that's so cool. Did you make t-shirts? Oh, so okay. So this is this is probably the worst thing I did out of all of it. I a couple of my college buddies and I we went down to see a UFC fight in Dallas, and we get to Dallas, and we go to what they consider a diner, which is nothing like we have here on good old Long Island or in Jersey, you know. <laughs> but uh, we get done eating breakfast, and Texas is one of the few states in the country where you can buy your own casket. So we leave, we leave the store, we leave the diner and there is this big store called Casket World. Now at this point, my, wow. okay, my, sorry, my, go ahead. 
my my mother has been burdened by everyone at this point asking what's going on with Sean. Can you tell us what's going on? So she asked that I basically reactivate my Facebook and make it like a, a blog or a journal. So I would do that all along the way. And everyone really like the amount of support I got from it was awesome. You know, it was like I still go back and read some of the comments people made and I just cry. But the point is, so there's Casket World. OK, selling your casket. I said, oh, guys, you got to get a picture of this. So I went in front of Casket World, went big old yeah. hokey smile. I put it on Facebook and within not even 30 seconds, my mother's on the phone. <laughs> Blank, 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 S-O, blank. And I was just like, you know what? I want to laugh at this. I, I just want to like, you know, I, I, I have a bunch of silly tattoos. And like one of the ones right after we got that diner and that picture, we went to go get tattoos together as friends. And I I got the, the silly Joker quote, you know, across my shin. Why so serious? And everyone said, well, that's for the Joker, right? I said, no, it's why so serious? Like, why do we have to be so serious about this? My life w was fun and making people laugh, you know, like that's just how I want to be, and that's how I want to be remembered. Mm -hmm. It's and in no way do I look at that as being fatalistic. You weren't being negative, you didn't want to die, you were just be you were not being so serious. And I, I love that. Me. And, <laughs> you know, I, me. I know your mom yelled at you. If you and I had been friends, I'd I would have called and put you over a big for that, man. Oh, thank you. But you know, so I get I get back from all these great trips. I get I get done doing my first season of coaching football in God knows how many years. And my folks said, Look, you know, we're going on a year of you being here still, you know, and, and you're doing everything you can. I had just gotten cleared to work out again, which has been such a huge part of my life ever since I was a little kid. And Rick, I'll I'll blame you for that for some of the people that you have uh cultivated their careers were some of my inspirations for that. So I, I blame you. Um, <laughs> my love affair with the weight room, but uh, basically my folks said, you need to put yourself back out there. And uh, it was difficult. You know, I managed to go on a few dates, but I was 300 pounds of corticosteroid moon face. And, you know, I had gone on dates with folks that had cancer themselves and they just were like, no, you're, you're too fat. <laughs> like something awful like that. And I, I went on a dating app and I, I saw my wife on there. Not now currently, that'd be terrible. Uh, but <laughs> back then when I was sick and we weren't together, she was on this app and I had noticed that I thought we were just friends. And I had noticed that she was kind of liking all my journal posts and whatnot. And, uh, you know, we wound up going ahead and I, I swiped right and she didn't. So I was like, oh man, that, that that's kind of rough. So I went on Facebook because I said, well, I'm I'm dying, so I might as well just shoot my shot. So I uh I sent her a message. I said, I know this is weird. And uh we talked probably for like five hours on on Facebook. And then the next day we went out for lunch for about six hours. And the next day we went out for coffee, and we've been attached at the hip ever since going on seven years and uh she left uh, a, a difficult situation and out of respect for her we'll leave it at that but uh she had a 14 month old daughter at the time and she asked me if i wanted to help raise her daughter with her and i said why me you're, you're a good looking woman you know she was a nationally ranked crossfit competitor and she said because i i believe in you and Mm, you know, something like that. She just, she walked out of a, a house fire into a forest fire. And I didn't want to have kids. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to have a house. I was living a very unfulfilling life, but I was living a life. I was like a meathead frat boy at this point, you know, and I met her and I, and I met this little tiny thing and I'm like, all right, you know what? You might as well get the experience. And I fell so madly in love with both of them that, frankly, I we can give all the credit to the doctors, those 30 teammates. We could say, you know, the, the wrestling, the this, the that, you know. No, I, I in my heart, I believe that I, I stayed here for those two, especially that little girl, you know. 
I know I, I we just had a, a, another baby girl of our own a couple of weeks ago. But Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. But, you know, that, our miracle baby, but that that little one, you know, even though she's not so little anymore, that, that's my best friend. That, that's my best friend in life outside my dad, you know, and, and my wife. But uh, no, and, and like you said, planning for the future. So from there, you know, we're together for a couple months and I'm saying to myself, I have a debt here that I can never repay. So I went ahead and I said, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to leave them with much. We weren't married, but I already had my mind made up that when I left, <laughs> they got everything. And I wound up actually starting one of the largest independent coffee chains on Long Island at that point. It's just as a way to try to make sure that I had something to, to leave them, a business. And uh, that kept me going too. And, you know, I'd go on chemo days from like 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning, just working and it just gave me purpose and it was successful and unfortunately it was a victim of covid but you know i'm so proud of the work i did with that company not so much you know the the brick and mortar stores we had but some of the great partnerships that we were able to establish and i you know i'm sure rick you're familiar with the venue the good old nassau coliseum sure. out here on long island you know that's that's the mecca here for us even though they have ubs arena now you know, the Coliseum is always going to be the Coliseum. Wow. But yep. I was able to get my company, uh, the concession stand rights. I was able to broker a partnership and a sponsorship with the professional lacrosse team that played there and the tennis tournament that was there. And the reason why I mention these things, and it's not to be braggadocious, it's just because I made some of the best business deals and work for those deals and phone calls for those deals from the chemo chair across the parking lot at Sloan Kettering in Nassau. So it was just like, I did not want to sit still. I just wanted to keep going and going and going and going. And, you know, COVID was difficult for everyone, but that's when I had to step away from my business because I had active cancer in my lungs and I couldn't be driving all over Long Island, checking on all the different locations. So uh, unfortunately, you know, COVID shut my business down, but COVID also made them start to take away some of my safety nets because I couldn't get to Sloan Kettering as frequently. So we kind of started to do a little bit of a tightrope walk at that point. So I don't know if you guys want to just, uh, I don't want to just keep going, but you know, it's. No, uh, I, I, there's just, I mean, there's so many things that you're saying that are so powerful and beautiful. And I just want to say like, thank you for sharing your story about, or the aspect of your story about your wife and your daughter. And it's just love heals. It really is a very powerful healing frequency. And I think a huge thing that is missing in the general world of healing is bringing more love and compassion into it. And I, I think that's so such a beautiful and poignant example of the power of love and how it can heal people. So thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to uh, add that in. Not, not a problem, you know, and, uh, you know, during COVID, uh, we, my, wife and I, at the time we went ahead and, you know, I was very stubborn and I thought, okay, this is not the time to purchase a home. And my wife was kind of leading the charge. Like, Hey, look at these mortgage rates. And I'm like, what are those numbers? I had no clue. So I just finally gave in and we, we got a house. We got engaged on the first day that we moved into the house. We've got it. We've gotten legally married at this house. So these are all things that were going on while I was still sick. And one of the coolest moments I have to say in my life was, you know, I stopped the treatment. I got to ring the, I got to ring the bell, you know, I went ahead and I got to stop taking the oral chemos that I actually have tattooed on my wrist here. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I got to stop taking those. And, you know, at that point they did a spinal, uh, spinal tap and the fluid came back clear. There's no lepto here. They had to rerun it. Wait, there's no lepto. You know, at this point, we're about maybe five years into me being sick. All my tumors at that point, they're like, this is necrotic tissue. There's nothing. What is going on? So like, <laughs> we need to figure this out. So they actually gave me a, a DNA test that was brand new technology. And, um, you know, waiting for the results to say, hey, look, it's going to take a couple months. And 
at this point, my, my stepdaughter, thank goodness she has my wife's intelligence. But uh, much to my wife's chagrin, she shares a lot of my interests. So <laughs> she she's become a little bit of a wrestling fan. And uh, we actually said, okay, you know what? Things seem to be going good. Things seem to be going great. Let's let's do something fun. Let, let's let's commemorate this. And uh, we we got a, we got a limo, and we went from Long Island, and uh, threw my stepdaughter in the car, and we got uh, tickets to a, a WWE uh, live event house show in Connecticut. You know that way I knew that things would be a little quicker, a little less talking. I kind of knew what to expect, so I didn't get yelled at by my wife going, "Oh, why are we seeing fingers and beer cans?" You know, I don't explain to her it's not like that anymore. Uh, but while we're on the way to this awesome thing, I'm getting to share this love of mine with another love of mine, my, my stepdaughter. And while we're in the car, the phone rings and I look at it and it's that number. And I'm sure many cancer patients and survivors can relate to it. You see those, that number come up on your phone. It, it's almost like someone kind of knocks the wind out of you every once in a while. Cause it's like, is this going to be the bad call? Is this going to be the bad one? And I picked it up and they said, uh, did you check your portal yet? My, my patient portal. I said, no, I, I didn't get a chance to today. Oh, you're you're on it every five seconds because I've always believed in advocating for myself. And I think, you know, that's something I omitted, you know, for your listeners that have dealt with cancer or had it's mm -hmm. advocacy. Uh, just, mm -hmm. just because your doctor says something, mm -hmm. you can politely ask or present your own retort, you know, by going ahead mm -hmm. and showing them, hey, look, I read this. What's the harm in trying to have them think a different way? But needless to say, they said, you, you didn't check your portal, huh? I said, no. And uh, the doctor said, can I give you some good news? And I said, sure. And they're sitting opposite of me in the limo. And they said, uh, you're the only person that we have documented that has no longer, no longer suffers from this cancer. The DNA test came back pristine. It almost basically told us it was an erroneous test because there was no cancer cells found. I broke down and, and cried. And I, I just I got so many chills, by the way. <laughs> Sit. I got I, I got I got to I got to hug my wife and, and hug my, my stepdaughter. And at that point, we finally shared with her, you know, your, your daddy has, has been sick for a little while. And uh she understood and, and she was happy that I was healthy. And then we got to go off and, and see the matches. And, you know, I, I called a buddy of mine who was able to get us some passes to a little bit of a pre-show experience where she got to actually get in the ring and take a picture, which to me as a kid, like, I don't know if it was a sensory thing or something, but I had to touch those ropes. I had to do something, you know, she got to hold the women's championship and take a picture with it to me, you know, shoot, I, I would have, Possibly, I don't know, at the age of four, I would have trampled over someone to maybe touch Hulk Hogan's belt. You know, like it, it was just such an awesome experience getting to do that with her. And, and then it wound up coming into like, well, what's next? And I shared the news with my friends and they said, you need to have some sort of party. You got a big old party. And I said, no, I can't have a party. And they said, but you're one of one. We got to celebrate. And I said, this is not the one of one that you celebrate. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, because I, I have brothers and sisters in this fight still that may not be as fortunate as I am. So there's nothing to celebrate yet. I don't want to be one of one in this situation. I don't want to be unique. I, I don't want anyone to have to suffer or deal with this. So they said, all right, you know, because they didn't fully understand it because they're not, they didn't get to be in the fight themselves, but they were there. Uh, so they said, how about a fundraiser? And I said, all right, I'll do a fundraiser. And uh, I picked Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, they said, well, you got to get some entertainment. Why don't you call up one of the wrestling promotions that you used to work with? And I said, all right. So we got the wrestling promotion there. And then one of my real wise ass friends came up with the brilliant idea of putting a poll on Facebook. If Sean wrestles again, will you come and donate more money? So we had a whopping 97% yes and a 3% no. And I think the 3% no was my mother, my father, my aunts, and my wife. I knew your mom was in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. And you know what? My mother could give Stone Cold Steve Austin a run for his money. Okay. She's, <laughs> she's the Irish female Stone Cold Steve Austin, raised <laughs> in Brooklyn, New York by Irish immigrants. So, you know, it's, uh, we, we had the fundraiser. I, I, you know, I would say reluctantly, but part of me was like giddy as could be going back into a ring. I got my hand held through a match, if we could even call it that. I won. Everyone was happy. Everyone was excited. Uh, fast forward to the next year. Um, unfortunately, my my stepdaughter was uh, with, with her birth father for that particular weekend. So that was supposed to be a one-off. And my sweet, loving stepdaughter went up to her mother and said, I didn't get to see daddy wrestle. Can I see daddy wrestle, please? <laughs> so no my bitch. wife took me into the other room and gave me quite the uh, speaking to, and then acquiesced and said, yeah, you get one more. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, the friend of mine uh, who kind of pushed me into doing it the first time had, uh, he had passed away in the line of duty uh, being a, a, being a fireman. So I wanted to, being that I didn't have cancer anymore, I wanted to not make it the Sean Wachter fundraiser. I did it in memory of him. And I asked his family, not only could, Hey, can I use his name, but could we also, is there a charity he was very favorable with? And he always gave part of his check to uh, St. Jude's. So we had the fundraiser for St. Jude's and, you know, being that it was held in memorial for him and he had died in the line of duty. A lot of media came, a lot of uh, press wound up coming as well. And at the end of the event, they, they came up to me and they said, we'd like to do, uh, do a story on you. And I said, well, wouldn't you want to do it on the event and on Michael, my friend that had passed? I said, no, there, there's something special about you. We want to do a story on you. I said, okay, but that's fine. Didn't think much of it. Uh, the, local, the local newspaper comes out the, the next week, and there's a two-page article on me with a picture of me with this championship belt swung over my shoulder, completely shirtless in an immaculate shape. And my wife, again, quite furious. She's like, oh, great. Now our entire town knows what you look like with no shirt on. Terrific. <laughs> so I just said, well, look at it this way. When you go to drop uh, you know, the kiddo off at school, maybe take a look at some of the other, uh, I don't know, dads and look at what you got. And she said, no, not at all. <laughs> so what ended up happening was, you know, I have a pretty great job with a company called Gig USA and, and we work with nonprofit organizations to kind of help streamline their fundraising and, and raise their brand awareness. And I'm their business development manager. And I went on a company retreat to uh, Cancun, Mexico, which was amazing. But during that time, I got to spend more time with the company's owner, and uh, he is a huge wrestling fan. So my entire company retreat was not talking about what do we have in the development pipeline, what do we got coming down the road. No, it was like, what do you think about Roman Reigns? What do you, what do you think happened last week on SmackDown? So, you know, I said to myself, you know what? Working in a position where I need to have people to have conversations with me to develop partnerships and business if my boss is signing off on it and loves it, let me post this article on LinkedIn. I, I posted it there and uh, the V Foundation, who I referenced earlier, kind of entered the chat, so to speak. And they said, this is an amazing story. And I had a back and forth with them and eventually got to the point where we started having emails and they said, you're going to be one of our people. That's amazing what you're doing. And being a marketer, when I spoke with the folks at ESPN very briefly, they said to me, oh, do you, do you still wrestle? So like I said, being the marketer, and I said, of course I do, which uh, again with my wife, but uh, luckily uh, New York Wrestling Connection, my home promotion, um, welcomed me back for a third time. And uh, now I'm, I'm a full-time wrestler and I'm a, uh, training with a former WWE tag team champion, Mike Mondo, who happens to be my uh, trios uh, partner for these particular championships over here. Uh, and honestly, uh, getting to use the platform of wrestling, something that I love so much and so dearly, you know, it, it's something that I considered my rock in the storm. And to get to use that platform now to show 
other people. Like I said, there's life during and there's life after. And who's to say that you can't get through this and can't chase your dreams yourself? You know, I'm a knucklehead and I'm getting to go out there and perform in front of hundreds of people and in October, thousands of people. And just to get out there and have people know my story. If I could, like I said, if I could let one person live a little bit fuller or fight a little bit harder by seeing me get in there and bump around and do my thing, I'd relive my worst cancer day over and over again. I'd go down the same road a thousand times because to not live a life of service or trying to inspire people on a second chance when most people don't get a second chance, I think would be spitting in the face of everyone that truly believed in me. And, and I'll and I'll cap this little soapbox with this, you know, I view cancer as the most beautiful thing that ever happened to me. It honestly gave me such a wonderful, wonderful, clear perspective of life, a profound appreciation for things that I took for granted. And, and also too, I've done the best quality living and the most productive living in my past seven years of life dealing with cancer and dealing after cancer than I did in the 31 years preceding it. It, it truly, uh, you know, they say you go into the storm and come out a different person. That that happened with me. That's wow. so powerful. <laughs> well, what, what to even comment about that, Amanda? This, this should be... Uh, <laughs> That this should be required well, curriculum for everybody that's going through it, man. That's like yeah, that. this is I an incredible story, an incredible journey that you walked us through. Thank you so much, seriously. Oh no, no, um, no, no problem. And it's just uh, you know, like I said, now all of a sudden I'm getting these great opportunities to get to share this with more people, like you guys have me here. You know, Melanoma Research Alliance as well. I'm I'm working with and. You know, they're so excited because unfortunately with the leptomeningital diagnosis, being of one of one, now they get someone from their own melanoma community that they can bring out and say, mm -hmm. this guy did it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's all I wanted to do. This was I just was chills again. Wait, I, I just want to say, because my cousin actually, I was much younger, um, but he was about 30 and he was diagnosed with melanoma and he wound up passing um, and it was in his brain. And I don't know all the details. I, again, this was a while ago, I was much younger, but um, it's just, it does have personal meaning for me. There was a lot of cancer in my dad's side of the family when I was diagnosed. So the whole pressure being on to change that pattern was very real, but my, cousin he actually had something very similar to what you went through and he didn't make it so it's just to hear that. Like, it's really powerful to hear your story um so thank you for sharing that and i just want to go back to something that you said in the very beginning and i actually can't remember the specific phrase that you said to your father but it was like you made a decision immediately that you were going to figure it out that you were going to survive and i feel like that is so powerful and i mean there's so many other things that we could talk about again but like you are the expert on yourself and to really yeah. be your advocate i i really wanted to re reiterate that point as well yes. because most of us are giving our power away to the people in the white lab coats and this is where we really have to take our power back for sure. So I wanted to bring that piece up again and thank you for this really powerful journey. I resonate with so much of it. Oh, it, it's not a problem though. Advocacy for yourself is so important. You know, mm -hmm. our doctors are great people. You know, not every doctor is perfect. Okay. Not every doctor walks on water, you know, to use a cliche, but at the end of the day, they're humans and they have hearts. Mm -hmm. And if they can't look, I have a I have a minor in research for one of my undergrads and like I was bringing them peer reviewed articles from like Harvard and nonsense like that. Yeah. You know what? I feel I firmly believe that people, even if they're just bringing a WebMD thing that has no applicable mm -hmm. use, you know what? Doctors should at least encourage their patients because mm -hmm. you know what? Just humor them, if, even if it's wrong, but applaud the initiative to not just sit back and go. Well, I have this disease now and that's going to be it. You know, 
the internet yeah. is a powerful tool, you know, support mm -hmm. communities, forums, you know, and that's also another thing not to go off on a tangent, but, you know, people need to realize, you know, with clinical research and these clinical trials, you know, I, I, I firmly believe where we're at with technology in this world right now and the place we're in, I, I like to think that soon with, with the funding and the right research, we, we will have an end to this disease in all of its faces, you know? Well, from your lips to God's ears, man. <laughs> yes, we, we, we like to be optimistic about that as well. Sean, how do people follow you? How, you're, you're such an inspiration. You have, I'm looking at the screen, it says, <laughs> at the cancer fighter, Sean Wachter. Yep, that's, that's, just, that's on Instagram. Instagram. Apologies. Um, how do people follow you on your journey today? I would say, you know, that that's the that's the, uh, the 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 tag there, the username. I'm still trying to catch up with some of the kids with the social media, not to sound too old, but uh, you know, it's at the Cancer Fighter Sean Walker at Instagram, and that's where I have, you know, I share a lot of my mixed martial arts stuff. I've been able to start doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu again, which I'm over the moon about. Uh, I've been starting doing Muay Thai again on top of the wrestling, so. I kind of try to share a little bit of everything on there, you know, whether it be fitness, martial arts, wrestling. Like I said, because whatever I do, I just want people to look at me and realize if I can do it, they can do it too. You know, they don't, it doesn't have to be wrestling. It, it could be running a 5K. It, it could be finishing a college degree. Just because you had a road bump in your mm -hmm. life doesn't mean that you have to give up on everything that you love. You know, as a matter of fact, embrace the things you love and help it guide you through. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's such a good point. Embracing it even more deeply. And you know what I, a phrase that came to me a little while ago is to just fall back in love with life, fall back yeah. in love with life itself. And that in itself, you don't even understand the power that that can have to heal you. I mean, not you, you, but like the general you, like we don't, we've become so disconnected from that. I think like most people, they're just kind of going on um, autopilot. Yeah. And, and we really are, I think this journey can really bring us deeper into what truly lights us up. What are we passionate about? What are we committed to? What are we devoted to? And yeah, I think there's so much power in that. So your journey is powerful. Thank you. I think that's a, I think that's a great place to wrap, Amanda, perfectly and, and beautifully said. Sean, I just, we're, we're at an hour, that hour raced by. That was, uh, <laughs> it's fun, guys. I, have to say, I want to make a comment though. Um, I, I mentioned when we first opened, in reading what you post, I'm like, this guy really strikes me as genuine. You, you are like the most genuinely real self-deprecating guy I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, haven't, you haven't seen me wrestle yet. I, I don't even want to I show you. Say you were a good wrestler, man. I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm still quite green. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that. Uh, dude, it's, it's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super glad we've met. Um, there's something else I want to mention to you offline. So I'll give you a call if that's all right. Perfect. By all, by all means. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for having me. Amanda, thank you for sharing as well. Mr. Bassman, Rick, I'm still getting used to calling you Rick because, you know, I was just please, like, said, please. <laughs> thank you. But thank you both for having me and, and thank you for giving me the platform to, to share my story. And I, I hope someone out there listening gets something of it and hopefully they get off the couch. That, that's yeah. what it's all about. They will. Um, much appreciation to you. Please send our love to your family. No, I will. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, job, guys. Enjoy your holidays, everyone, and happy Me holidays. Too. Have, well, have a good night, son. Good night now. Wow, powerful story. I I love Super that guy. He's like my new favorite person. Yeah, he's awesome. He's so great. I, there's so many nuggets in there, so many golden nuggets. Well, Amanda, as always, amazing job on your part, as always. And um, uh and great, great to see you. And yeah, we'll, uh, you as well. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it again this coming week. Oh, we will. <laughs> so many more to come. You want to take us home for the evening here? Well, thank you again for joining us on this really epic 
episode. I am so grateful for everybody who's tuning in and I hope you received some nuggets of wisdom. There were so many golden nuggets and such a powerful journey. Really, all of the aspects that he's spoken to are really incredibly important. So if you need to go back and listen, do it. (laughs) Anyway, we will be back with more amazing guests. So we'll see you in the next onward and upward in love and light. And we'll see you soon.